<laughs> yeah, you know what? That and the cold weather, man, because I'm shaking. I can't deal with the cold weather, guys. Yeah. I was going to make a joke, but then on? I saw the, the okay, actual temperatures in the 20s. So uh, yeah, beautiful, snowing. sunny Topeka. <laughs> yeah, I'm not used to I mean, I just got back from Houston. I mean, I live in Houston, and it's like yeah. in the 70s when I left. But I, I heard we had a cold front coming in. So, But I, I, I'm not used to this kind of weather. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I'm in the D- I'm in the DC area. Um, Sebastian's joining us from New York, so it- it's a gloomy day here too. So we're on the yeah. on the kind of same tip here. But um, you know, welcome back to the RBR recap uh, presented by Round by Round Boxing. I'm Alex Burgos, joined uh, by my special co-host, Sebastian Milo, and then also a special guest Showtime Zone, El Diamante, Raul Marquez. I do have to preface, as the legendary <laughs> Kid Frost said, this is for the raza, you know, this episode. Yes, oh, so, I like <laughs> that, bro. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Raul, welcome, man. Um, I wanted to jump right in, you know, and, and, and talk a little bit about why you're in Topeka, which is the Showbox right. um, card. Uh, another healthy, fun card with guys that, you know, are putting the O's on the line and things like that. Want to touch briefly on the main event, RGO uh, Holmes against Ismael Villarreal. Uh, what are your thoughts on on the card itself and just the, the main event also? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, the, this fight. You know, there's a lot of storylines, especially the, the first, the opening fight with uh, Kurt uh, Scobie against uh, John Manu from Australia. And then Scobie has a very interesting story. You know, he's been through a lot in his life. And, uh, you know, he was a, a football player in college. And uh, he decides he wants to be a boxer. He's undefeated. He's 10-0 with eight knockouts. And he's, he's putting his record on the line, too, with a guy from Australia that, you know, is is fine for the first time here in the United States. He says this is the land of opportunity. And he's trying to make a name for himself, too. And Misael Lopez against Edward Vasquez, two really good fighters. That's going to be a good little scrap. But like you said, the main event, someone's always got to go. Adriel Holmes, the last time he fought was in March of last year uh, when my son, uh, Giovanni Marquez, who's 4-0 now with three knockouts, I had to put him in there. You know, I kinda, every time <laughs> I get a chance to put my son in there, I'm going to promote plug. him. But, yeah, quick plug. Uh, that was the last time Adriel Holmes fought. He had been off for quite a while before that, like almost two years. He fought Vernon Brown. Uh, he looked good, you know, he, for, he despite being out for so long, he took care of business. Uh, and he's finding a hungry guy now, and Ismael, Ismael Villarreal, who's undefeated. It looks like he's a, a a knockout guy. He he, you know, we had him in the fighter meetings earlier, and he said, "I'm I'm I'm looking. I want the knockout." You know, his his mindset is to seek and destroy. So it's going to be a very interesting fight because you got the typical matchup. You got a guy that's the, the more of a boxer, a ranger fighter like Adriel Holmes. He's got a like a six inch. Uh, height advantage and like 74 and a half uh, reach uh, compared to Villarreal, who's a lot shorter. He's 5'8". Villarreal is going to bring it. He knows he's got to close the gap, man. So uh, they're both, they both know from what I saw in the fighter meetings, they're both motivated. They both know that a lot of it is at stake, you know, because they're both undefeated. And with a very, uh, you know, a, a good win here will put a I'm in different spots in a better spot. Yeah, and that's what I love about Showbox. Um, Sebastian, before I kick it to you real quick, I mean, Villarreal's coming off a big win over uh, LaShawn Rodriguez, who's decorated mm-hmm, amateur in his own right. Um, so mm-hmm. he's kind of trying to take that that next step up. But um, Sebastian, I'll kick it to you. Yeah, 100%. I mean, just talking about that main event, Holmes versus Villarreal, you got two guys undefeated. Villarreal from Bronx, New York. Holmes from uh, Flint, Michigan. Tough neighborhoods, obviously. Tough upbringings. Um, so they have the tenacity and the willingness to go out there and, and and fight, obviously. But for a lot of those guys, Raul, who maybe don't know these two guys, Holmes and Villarreal, too well, what would be your message to them to tune into this fight and, and make sure that they keep their eyes on these guys who are probably the next step towards uh, a big fight one day and also putting themselves on the map with this main event? Well, look, I mean, this guy's had a decorated amateur career, especially Adriel Holmes. He won national titles. And they're both undefeated. They're they're trying to make it in this. Uh, it's a, it's a tough sport and a tough business. And uh, you know sometimes here on Showbox, uh, you get better fights, man, because these guys they go at it. They know what's at stake. They want to get to the Showtime Championship level fights. So my advice: why people should tune in. I mean, I think as a matter of fact, I think all three of these fights are going to be very competitive. I think all three of them could end in knockouts, especially the first two. Uh, these are hungry young guys that are undefeated or have taken like 
like Misael Lopez, you know, he took a, a loss here on Showbox, got a win too. And, uh, you know, he's changed trainers. Uh, just because he lost, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You know, he still has this, another opportunity here on Showbox against Edward Vasquez, who's another hungry fighter that for the first time we're going to see him, he's trying to prove himself. So at the end of the day, what my point is, is that all these guys are hungry to make it to the top. So uh, we it's, it's, it's going to be a very exciting night. And uh, that's why people should tune in on on Showbox, obviously, a lot of great fighters have come out of there. And hopefully, you know, with these fights, all three of them, obviously, we see some next generation guys stepping along the way. But just to jump back a little bit towards what happened last week, we have to talk about a Showbox alum. Uh, okay. Exactly. I was going to, yeah. Yeah. I was going to bring Jackie that up. I, I believe he's the 88th guy to come out of the Showbox uh, platform and win. And he's two and two on, on Showbox. And I remember the first time, man, we had, you know, he's from Houston. I, I seen Oshaki grow in Houston when he moved from Orange, Beaumont, Texas. He went through some of the same gyms that my kids boxed at, and he went through the amateur program. But the first time we had him on Showbox, man, we we fought. It, I think I believe it was in Vegas, in old Vegas, old time Las Vegas, and it was it was cold that night. But literally, he froze, man. That I, that just wasn't his night. He couldn't pull the trigger. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was the the cameras. I don't know if he saw Barry Tompkins. <laughs> and he got nervous and you know the rest of the crew i don't know what it was but that shows you how fighters could learn from that and turn their their boxing life around look where he's at now he just won a world title against a a very tough guy known guy uh, uh ray vargas yeah definitely i think um I'll, I'll go back a week ago, Sebastian, to something you covered, the Super Bowl, because that storyline with Jalen Hurts, I think, can apply to Oshaki Foster as well. It's like it shows perseverance, you know, tenacity when you get a loss, you know, and, and Foster's a great example of that. You keep pushing. And I remember talking yes. to him back in the day on Instagram, you know, because that platform, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to get eyeballs on you. You're trying to get people to recognize you. And he'd be like, hey, bro, you know, can you make me something? And I would put graphics on there because I just love the way he fought. And, uh, you know, he had a good amateur background and it's great to see that not only did he get that opportunity for the title, but, you know, he took full advantage of it in one. So um, to both of your points, yeah, I mean, it's just it shows me. Lopez is a good example. He lost to a guy from my area in Jordan White. Uh -huh. But again, fun to watch. Both guys are still on the up and up and we'll see what he could do tomorrow. Um, Raul, you mentioned a little bit about your son and I actually wanted to, to mention that as well. But you, you know, your story in boxing has, you know, been amateur, pro and success all along the way, you know, champion, uh, Olympian. And then now, you know, I'm sure a proud boxing dad, but also a vet behind the mic, you know, and so yeah, not only just for people, but you know, I'll, I'll put it out there too, for Latinos as well. We see you and we're like, man, he's, he's kicking it in English and Spanish. And, you know, you're just doing it all encompassing, um, a full boxing life. So what the sport can really, you know, do, but talk to us a little bit about your journey, you know, starting from fighter and then moving behind the mic. Hey, listen, by the way, that I really, I really appreciate all the love, man. And all the love that I get on social media uh, with people talking about my broadcast and talking about my career and, you know, my son, it's, it, it feels good. You know, it feels like, Hey, we, you know, we're doing something good, you know, and, and I have, my son's a good kid too. And he's trying to make a name for himself, but you know, me, when I started boxing, I started boxing at eight years old. Uh, I was born in Mexico. I was born in Vallehermoso, Tamaulipas. And uh, I was born with a midwife. I was born in a in a, uh, uh, a one-bedroom house. You know, it had, it had a dirt floor, you know. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't even born in a hospital. But the story was when I was born, you know, my mom was getting birth to me. My, my dad said I was throwing punches. And he said he's going to make me a, a world champion one day, a boxer one day. Because my dad was a... He was a huge boxing fan. He followed all the old time, old school guys, but from uh, Ruben Olivares and Carlos Sarate, Lupe Pintor, all those guys, the, the Mexican fighters, uh, the old school days, you know. And uh, so, you know, he got me into boxing, man. And uh, I started winning all these little tournaments and I started winning all around Houston. Before you know it, I'm winning the state in Texas. I, you know, make the long story short, you know, I, 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 in 89, I made the, the, I won the U.S. Nationals, my first national title. As an amateur, I was on the uh, national team for four years, from 89 to 92, traveled the whole world. Uh, and when I say the whole world, the whole world competing in USA versus Russia, uh, Italy, Germany, uh, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, fought all over the United States. And in 92, I made the Olympic team, man. And I was I was one of the favorites to win the, the, the gold medal 
or at least metal in the Olympics. And, uh, you know, they, they had a new com computer scoring system back then. And uh, I ended up losing in the quarterfinals, a fight that I, I thought I won. A lot of people thought I won. It could have gone away. It was what hurt so much was that the guy that beat me went out to the finals and got a silver medal. And the guy that won the gold medal, the Cuban, Juan Lemos, I had beat like four or five months before the Olympics. But, you know, it wasn't the Olympics. Of course, I turned pro. I had a pretty decent uh, professional career. I think, you know, we made some mistakes. Me and my father, we were new and, you know, the whole management. Like, I, I've always had the mentality of, like, old school. You know, you're going to fight the best to be the best. And, uh, you know, now, of course, it's more business. Uh, sometimes necessarily some of the fighters don't fight the best or they, or they don't want to fight the best. You know, they, it takes a while for, for it to happen because they want more money or for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, I had a successful career as a, as a professional. I still became a world champion. And then I got into broadcasting, man. Even when I was a uh, – I think that's the best thing that could have happened to me. When Even when I was an active fighter, I got into broadcasting. I had an opportunity that, you know, some – uh, a, a producer gave me an opportunity, Rick, Rick Sierra, I'll never forget, hey, you want to try broadcasting? I said, yeah, this was like in 1996, 97. I said, yeah, I'll try it out. And from there, it just grew. It grew. And being the aggressive-minded guy that I am, because I was an aggressive fighter, and, and I'm an aggressive person in life, I always, hey, I mean, I want to do this again. Give me an opportunity. Let me try this. Let me try that. And I've done, I've, I've been in so many platforms doing broadcasting ever since then, you know, like Spanish, English, different uh, channels, whatever, until... Uh, in 2012, I got with Showtime, you know, so I've been with Showtime for, I'm going to my 11th year, uh, as a broadcaster, you know, and, uh, you know, doing Showtime championship boxing in, in Spanish. And, you know, sometimes I do it in English, the, the big shows and I've done Showbox too for, I got in October that year, I joined Showbox. So yeah, I'm going on 11 years. Uh, it's great. It's fun. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a great family to be with and, you know, we all have, we always have a great time and I'm always trying just to learn and 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 be the best you know so i could give the people the audience my, my fans you know a breakdown of of uh, of the fights that i'm covering you know it's just to me it's just like sitting in the living room i'm you know dabbing a carne asada fajitas with three guys drinking beer and you know we're talking boxing bro that's the way i treat it as and uh that that makes me feel good i mean to to be a part of this yeah, and maybe it's me also in that realm, too. It feels familial when I'm hearing you call fights, walking people through fights, what we're seeing. It just feels right, and it feels like something I was used to growing up watching. So kudos to you, man. Uh, really, really awesome to always hear you, like you said, in English, Spanish, the show box or championship boxing has, has been really cool right. to track your progression. And I will say, I loved, uh, you know, like, the Bronco McCart fight, uh, the Shibata Flores. Like, th those fights for me, like, when you oh, say man, you fought... You're yeah right. when you say you fought guys you know because now you know people are like oh if you, you're not on pay-per-view you don't fight that big fight they don't know the names but in those right. days you know even if we're talking about friday night fights and stuff like that there were high level fights and there were tough fights yeah. and I, f I feel like you're cut from that cloth and from from that mold so uh kudos uh, i appreciate it team. man yeah i mean I, I fought on usa tuesday night fights like five exactly. times i was fighting right. guys like skipper kelp if if people know Skipper Cup, I mean, that was a guy that was a national champion. He was, yeah. he was tough. It wasn't an easy fight. It wasn't just a layover, you know. And uh, like I said, I've always had the mentality: uh, you got to fight the best to try to be the best. And I, I got where I got to, and uh, you know, I'm blessed. Do you think that's the biggest change? You know what you were talking about, just fighting the best to be the best. Do you think that's the biggest change from your fighting days to what the state of boxing is today? When you look at it, uh, I, I think so. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, because a lot of fighters right now, you know, we we've had them those problems lately and for a while. While they, some of the, you know, some of the best fighters don't want to fight the best in their weight, or you know, the whole thing with different promoters too. That the politics of boxing, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a total different business nowadays. Yeah, especially with the, like you said, the networks, the promotions, the politics exactly get in the way. The politics, not, yeah, that's that's the best way of putting it. It's you're, not you're right. authentic anymore. Sometimes it feels it's too business like. Yeah, yeah. Back then, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, fights were made. I mean, even before my time, because I grew up watching Chavez, you know, and then you know the the you know you got guys like Tommy Hearns, uh, Hagler. I mean, that's that that's my you know that's what I like to Tommy Hearns, Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Duran, the what those guys. They, they didn't care to take a loss or two losses or three losses. They, they were fighting each other, man. And that's what 
they gave people what they wanted to see. And like I said, I think nowadays it's more more of a they treat it more as a business, the the money and and I understand you want to get paid. I, I get it. But sometimes you have to take certain fights to to get to the money fights. And that's the way I believe back then. And I and I believe that most of the fight the, the big name fighters that I'm talking about, they taught the same way too, man. Even my Olympic uh teammate, a uh, roommate, Oscar de la Hoya, I mean Look how many fights he took. Big fights. He made a lot of money. If you think about it, he was the draw, but he made a lot of money as a loser because a lot of the big fights he lost. Mm -hmm. If you really think about it, that you know all, all the big fights, he lost a lot of big fights. You know, so but he he gave people what they wanted to see. Yeah, hope you definitely. guys agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I yeah, I yeah, mean, I mean, even think I mean, about even, it. Yeah. yeah, when you start thinking about yeah, the Mayweather, the Trinidad, but even the ones that he won, you know, could have been close to Corte. I thought, I thought the second Mosley fight he probably won, but you know, it, yeah. it was always entertaining. It was always entertaining. Yeah. He always gave you what you exactly. want. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And, and to your point, like there's very few guys today, you know, who are willing to take legacy over money, you know, or or fight for legacy over money, like. Canelo, I give the guy a lot of credit. Obviously, to your point, he's you know, one of the best pound for pound. But him going up to go fight against a guy named Bivol at 175. I do. Legacy, I do. That's a rare thing today. and it's He's one of the few. I do. You're absolutely right. When he fought Bivol, you know, and, and, and of course, you know, people want to see him fight uh, David Benavides. You know, that that's a big fight. Uh, but when he fought Bivol, you have to give it to Canelo. You know, he he is a smaller guy. And Bivol is more than naturally, uh, you know, solid guy at that weight uh so I, I do give him credit he is one of the, probably the, one of the few the only one pretty much if you really think about it so let me ask you uh during the tank davis fight week we were interviewing in a group uh Derek james and you kind of came up real quick uh oh, that's him right. and, yeah. and gave him a hug and uh yeah. so you guys know each other from the amateurs both texas guys so oh yeah but i want to i want to talk about spence and, and crawford real quick but then also tell us about your your background with Derek james and and how well, you guys know each other well listen me me it's crazy how everybody's still you just don't know man we we known each other since the junior olympic days so we want me and Derek uh james won the national junior olympics together in 1987 in marquette michigan and you know he was a good fighter good skills talent uh, I, I believe in the Olympic trials. Uh, he tried to make the Olympic team. He, I, I think he lost to Chris Bird. Okay. And as a professional, he, I mean, I guess he never really developed or made it, you know, because he never became a world champion. But I, I knew about Derek and, you know, he always had good skills. And, and then I had my route as a, as a, you know, amateur. I made the Olympics and, you know, I went pro. But I, I know we go back and we think about it like back then, nobody would ever thought that, oh, I was going to be doing broadcasting for Showtime one day you know, Spanish and English or whatever. And at that point, nobody thought, I mean, Derek James, he's one of the best trainers out there right now. Look who he trains, you know. Uh, Errol Spence, I trained Anthony Joshua, you know, the Charlo. And uh, I'm happy for him. It's just, you know, it, it, it makes me happy to see somebody succeed like that because, you know, boxing is a, a tough sport. It's a, The business of it is even tougher. And not only that, you know, the the you see so many fighters that, uh, you know, the punches, you know, how they affect you, you know, uh, and and a lot of, you know, going back to a lot of fighters that make a lot of money and they end up being broke, you know, and it's 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 a, it's a crazy sport, man. And just to see someone like like Derek James be where he's at as a trainer, it makes me proud. It makes me happy. I'm really happy for him. We're both happy for each other. You know, definitely. Yeah. You guys have both yeah. uh, blazed the path that that's excellent. So I want to now ask you, you know, obviously one trainer or one fighter that he trains, uh, Errol Spence. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about, you know, you mentioned uh, Leonard, um, Hearns. They fought in their early 20s. I mean, and now we're looking at, you know, potentially not getting the marquee welterweight title clash in mm -hmm. uh, maybe of this generation in, in, in Crawford and Spence. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? If it ever did happen in the next year or so, who do you favor? Well, look, I mean, not just because I'm Derek's friend and I grew up. Uh, I saw Errol grow up in amateurs, too, because my oldest son, uh, Raul Marquez Jr. He used to fight, so we followed uh, Errol in the amateurs. And you know, I, as a matter of fact, he fought in Houston one time. Uh, I've always loved his style, man. I, I even when he was an amateur, I said he's going to be a really good pro. And uh, I think I, I mean we want I want to see that fight. I want to see that fight. I believe him and Crawford are great fighters. Uh, I think you know, like I, I see, I see Errol. Um, he's a grinder. You know, he might have some bad rounds early on but you better have you know you better 
be a big dog, man. You have to have some dog in you because he, he, you know, like I've, I've said this before in some interviews, like he's got, he's got his own style, you know, but remember I'm Mexican and he's got a lot of the Mexican style fight. And, you know, he comes forward and he throw, he's got a good body attack. He takes a good shot, you know, and he's, he's got good, you know, defense. He mixes it up good defense behind a good jab. He's a grinder. And I love that. That's, that's my style. You know, that's my style of fighting. Not taking anything away from Crawford. I mean, Crawford is a good fighter too, man. Exceptional boxing skills. He's fast. He's elusive. He's man. He's a good fighter, man. He's that. That's why people want to see that fight. I can't really. I, I'm not gonna pick. You know, of course, my heart is with someone like Errol. I think Errol will take over. But hey, it's it's a fifty fifty fight. Put it that way. I mean, that's why people want to see it. You talked about you know loving loving to watch that style that Errol puts in. Are there mm-hmm. maybe a couple fighters, like three fighters that you really enjoy watching nowadays? Uh, yeah, Errol's one of them. Errol's one of them. Uh, Jerron Ennis, who grew up on uh, Showbox. That's what I see. I mean, a lot of good fighters come out of Showbox, man. And yeah. uh, Jerron Ennis is, is really, you know, a really, he, I'm really impressed by him. A lot of people, you know, his last fight, maybe he didn't look like he was supposed to, but hey, he got the win. He got the rounds in. He had never gone full 12 rounds. He needed to go those two rounds. And he fought a guy that, you know, wasn't really there. Like, he, you know, he uh, he made it difficult because uh, he was, uh, to me, he was more in surviving, survival mode. And it's hard to fight when you fight somebody that's just surviving. And there's a difference between fighting a guy that's surviving than a guy that at least he's trying, you know, uh, that when a guy uh, opens up himself and, you know, takes more risks, then there's more opportunities for someone like Jerron to connect them. So, um yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I, I like Errol Spence, Jerron. I, I like a lot of fighters, man. There's a lot of names out there, up-and-coming fighters. I like my son, Giovanni Marquez. We're learning. We, we're in the gym every day. We we sparred with Shakur. We sparred with Devin Haney. We sparred with Oshaki before. Austin Trout. I try to give him some good work, man, because right now it's, it's, you know, sometimes with the way the boxing world is, everybody wants a piece of everything, and it, it's just hard to – uh, we're trying to get him with the right, per, you know, promoter and and uh, and try to move him up and, and and you know get him more fights and uh, and get some more. So talking about Giovanni, I mean, it, it's interesting yeah. because we we're talking about the the politics and you know things like that and, and the way that it was back in the day. How do you balance that kind of in leading him now in this generation as a pro? What would you like to see from him? I mean getting more experience, but obviously, you know, stepping up against tougher competition probably sooner rather than later, right? Yeah, you know what, he's 4-0, Giovanni, you know, but I'm, 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 I have an open mind. Like, now the new generation, the fighters, are, they, they think different, they see things different. And I think what helps me with my son is that I let him have an opinion. You know, I'm not like the old school trainer, hey, it's my way or the highway. And there's a lot of old school trainers like that. No, you got to let the guy think, you know, and I'm open. Like, say, sometimes he comes, I always tell the story. He comes in the gym and I see he's a little bit tired or it's not this day. I say, you know what? Just go home, take off, come back the next day. And it makes him, it makes him, uh, you know, getting that rest makes him better come back the next day. Uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, things he does, you know, he, my son uh, is not just, he doesn't have my stuff. He just doesn't come forward. He, he's, he could be a little bit slick. Uh, you know, he, he could be flashy. And, and for me, if that works sometimes, I'm okay with it. And, you know, of course, there's other trainers that are not going to allow that. Always keep your hands up here. I mean, if you will have them here and that makes you feel comfortable, then let it let it go, you know. And because I, I look at it this way. You could have your hands up here. You could still get knocked out. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's like, if you don't have your hands up, you're going to get knocked out. Not not really, because you could have your hands up right here. Somebody could throw a hook and open up that guard and then catch with an uppercut. It's the same thing, but it's whatever makes the, the fighter feel comfortable. If he feels comfortable with his hand, jab hand down here, uh, and if it's working, then let it go. You know, so we, we, we just we have conversations like that. We talk a lot. We talk about when he spars. We talk about, you know, say he spars with Shakur or the other local guys uh, back back home and stuff. Uh, you know, what? how did you feel? How did you do wrong? Did he hurt you at all? Uh, you know, I'm always like, you know, someone like Shakur, man, you got to be on point, bro. Like I, I seen him rock guys in, in the gym where he puts them to dance, you know, like because they're wobbly and stuff. So. Of course, I don't want my son to get set up like that either. You know, so I say you gotta the whole time when he's sparring a guy level. It, it don't matter who, but especially Shakur. You know, you gotta be real. Like you gotta be on point, man. You gotta be ready for anything. You gotta be. I always think 
that guy's trying to knock me out or, or set me up with something. And because Shakur, he's a smart fighter, he does that. He lets you get comfortable. He, you know, he'll touch you with a jab, and then all of a sudden, boom, he'll rip a big uppercut or hook. Those kind of things. And I said, no matter what, all, first round, second round, third round, the sixth round, you always got to be ready for whatever he's going to bring. Definitely, yeah. It sounds like he's getting a lot of great work. That's uh, excellent. And who who better than Raul Marquez to be the one leading the way for you? So he's lucky to have you as his dad. But Sebastian, before I kick it to you to ask a question, I just wanted to ask one more on a fight coming up. And we briefly discussed uh, David Benavides, but that fight uh-huh. against Kayla Plant, I want to get your thoughts on that one, man, because that one's I'm I'm really excited about that one. Yeah, I mean, David is uh, Benavides. You know, he him and his family they're they're friends. Of- Mine too, you know, they're friends, and I know Caleb Plant and his father too. That Caleb put on a good performance against Canelo, uh, and then you know, when he knocked out Durrell, you know, the way he sat on his shots and knocked him out, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight. Uh, it's, it's you know, people want to see it. I, I, I just think very highly of Benavides. I love the way he puts his combination punching together, you know, and then he tries to land that big bomb. He's, a, he, he's, he's tall, he's big for his weight class. I'm going with Benavides. And Raul, you know, you touched on something earlier that stuck with me. You know, obviously you talked about your successes. You know, you were an IBF junior middleweight champ back in 97. But you also were pretty open about saying how you made mistakes along the way, right? Yeah. Um, When you look back at your career, what are some of those lessons that you take away and tell young fighters like your own son about their own careers and, and guiding them through your own experiences? Well, listen, one of the biggest. Okay, so. In 1997, I fought on the De La Hoya Camacho undercard. I fought a guy named uh, Keith Mullins, okay? Nobody knew much about Keith Mullins. Keith Mullins was a really bad dude. He was a bad dude, bro. Like, he was – I knew him from the amateurs. And then, let, me, let me finish telling you the story about Keith – or maybe you know because you've done research. But Keith Mullins – actually, I was going to fight Uruboy Campus on that, but Uruboy got hurt. Had I fought him there, I would have beat him. Okay, but I fought Keith Mullins. The point is, I got cut up really bad. I mean, like 70-some stitches, inside, outside, whatever. It was bad. That was in September, okay, of 1997. In December the 6th or something like that, I'm in there with your boy campus. At that point, your boy's supposed to be the next Chavez. He's knocking everybody out. I believe he only had like two losses. I should have never taken that fight. I mean, September. Then I'm back in the gym in, in October, November. Then – Early December, here I am fighting this monster that has a lot of power, comes forward, Mexican-style fighter. I should have – and my dad, I remember my father telling me, hey, your face is getting swollen like in the gym, you know? And I said, no, you know, tough, young, stupid. You know, no, 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 I want to fight this guy. I'm going to take care of business, blah, blah, blah. Well, I should have never taken that fight. I should let my face heal. But you also had pressure from the promoter back then, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you don't. Yeah, it's 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 a hard question. You you don't know when the promoter will sit you out, or you don't want to fight. We must sit you out for a year. You're not gonna fight. But I should let my face heal, right? And you know, sure enough, when I went to the doctor, I said, "Yeah, your face was. It looked fine from the outside, but from the inside, it was still traumatized." So that's why when they when I fought Uruguay Campus in December '97 uh, in Atlantic City, that I fought with Fred Rivera, Keith Mullins fought terrible Terry Norris, the best of my era. And I fought your boy campus. Okay. So when they stopped my fight in the eighth or ninth round, the fight was even. One just had it for me, one just had it for him, one just had it even. So it was an even fight. And yeah, he heard me. I went back to the world. I could, I could my face, man. I look like the elephant, man, bro. Like I, I, I couldn't see. Like it just, it, I, was, I had little bitty cuts, but my face just swole up so big that I couldn't see no more. So they stopped the fight, lost the title. I was off for like eight, nine months. Came back and fought Chibata Flores, a good fighter, decent fighter on ESPN, yeah. and I beat him. But that night, terrible Terry Norris, the best fighter of my era at that time, junior middleweight division, which if you guys don't agree, I could do the research. He gets knocked out by Keith Mullins. You know what I mean? You just don't know what could have happened, bro. Like I, He gets knocked out by Terry Norris. I mean, by Keith Mullins. And, you know, an Oscar beat uh, Rivera. But why? What was another reason why I took that fight? Because there was a promise from top rank, Bob Aaron, whatever, to fight. If I win this fight against uh, uh, your boy campus, I'm probably going to fight Oscar the following year for, you know, it was a good story, millions of dollars. 
what well, Olympic uh, Olympians got. He's the golden boy. I'm el diamante. I'm the Mexican guy that comes forward. You know that kind of stuff. And um, you know it never happened, but you know th things like that. You know, I, I now I learned it. if that ever happens to myself. Hopefully, it never happens. You know, but sometimes you don't have to take fights like that just because you get in the so much pressure or whatever. And uh, and sometimes you might want to go a different route. You know, you might want to fight the small. You don't have to fight King Kong. You could fight smaller guys that come up from one. You know, like I was one fifty four. I could have been a good example. I fought Romalis Ellis, one of my title defenses. He won a bronze medal in the eighty Olympics. But guess what? He was more like a 147 pounder that came up to 154. Whacked him out in three or four rounds on ABC, Wild World Sports, Network TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I could have milked that title and fought those type of guys. I could have fought Steve Pratt, you know? You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, But you guys get it. Yeah, until I fought, sure. until I, I, until I, you know, uh, maybe, you know, made six, seven defenses, five, and then and fought Talahoya or, or or terrible Terry Norris or the big names for a lot of money, which is more business. Looking at it business business way, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. for sure. We yeah. appreciate it. That's a it's a lot of backstory and and something interesting to consider too. Yeah, when you're talking about a fighter coming up, but yeah, I think everything you mentioned with Talahoya, man, that that whole storyline to build it that would have written itself, like you were saying, El Diamante, the Golden Boy, the Mexican style. Like, man, R Richard that, got, Schaefer, that got me excited just hearing about it. R Richard Safer would always talk about it too, man. He had the promotion, you know, El Diamante, mm -hmm. the Golden Boy. They were best roommates. They were friends. Now they're enemies mm -hmm. or whatever. Now they meet in the mm -hmm. ring at 20 some years later or whatever. You know, they, it, it was always talked about, um, but it never happened, you know. But I, like I said, I'm I'm blessed to be where I'm at, man. I've, I've been in the boxing business since I was eight years old, you know. In the amateurs, I had, you know, like I said, a a a, a decorated amateur career. So I, I was I was telling a story to somebody the other day. Like first time I ever went to Vegas, like I was with uh, Pernell Whitaker, and you know, I was with the Duva camp. I was like 15 years old. I'm staying at Caesar's Palace, like for two or three weeks. Lou Duva's like, you know, here. I mean. Eat whatever you want, buy whatever you want. I'm in training camp with them. In training camp with John John Molina, Evander Holyfield, uh, Melrick Taylor, the different cities, you know, as an amateur coming up. So, you know, and then like I said, my professional career, now my broadcasting career. I I'm 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 blessed, man, compared to you know, a lot of other, like I said, a lot of other fighters. Raul, we really appreciate your time, and hopefully, this is not the last time you join us because this was fun. Um, it was, man. I had fun. I, you know, absolutely, guys. I mean, and, and I appreciate you guys because it's not just about us, you know, the fighters or ex-fighters. Because we need people like you guys to put our name out there, and you know, maybe get us get us in different spots, better spots sometimes, you know, and put our name out there. So, yeah, I, I thank you guys for having me on. Means a lot. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for everything you're doing too, and uh, we'll keep enjoying. Do it you. for the ra how is it, bro? Do it for the yeah, raza. The raza. This one's for the raza, <laughs> like his frost said. Yeah, that's for it, sure, like for sure. Frost. Yeah, that's Kid Frost back in the day. But um, yeah, we look forward to the Showbox fight tomorrow. You know, a solid card, like we mentioned. So we'll see yeah. how those play out, and then um, you know, hopefully we can catch up before another big one as well. Make sure you guys tune in. The best in the broadcasting business: myself, Barry Tompkins, Steve Farhood, and Brian Campbell. Can't miss it, guys. Thank you for listening to the RBR Recap. Make sure to follow us on social media at RBR Recap and visit RBRRecap.com for the latest episodes.